the Bible to see what a church should be, and you look until you find it. He said, well, you know, I'm a Christian, but I don't really believe in the Bible either. I said, oh, why not? He said, well, you know, so many people have so many different interpretations of what it means, and, you know, who really knows? I just, I don't really believe in the Bible. As I continued to talk to him, I found out that there was a whole host of things that he didn't believe in. He didn't believe hell existed because, well, he didn't really like to believe that. It was a scary thing. He didn't really believe that uh, God would send anybody there if it did exist because that didn't fit his picture of God. He told me I live with my girlfriend and, you know, people don't like that, but, you know, the God I worship doesn't really mind. And there are all these things that we know God has told us are unholy. And he thought, you know, I'm a Christian. You know, I had this amazing story. All these things have happened to me. Of course that was God. Of course I'm okay now. But the way that he was living was unholy. And this is not one man. This is not those people. This is not just those outside the church. This is largely all of us. Because we have a way that we like to live. And we have experiences with God, and we say, okay, well, you know, God has saved me, God has done all these things. But, you know, I don't really like all these parts in the Bible right here. No. This disagrees with what I think. Or this disagrees with what society's big cause is right now. You know, whatever it is that's popular, this doesn't really agree with it, so I'm going to stick with society. And so many things, we don't pursue the scriptures deeply to see what holiness is and follow after it. We just jettison it for whatever we started with, whatever our politics are, whatever we grew up with as a family, whatever fits our particular desire, whatever's popular, whatever's going to keep us out of trouble. And instead of following deeply after God, we just let it go. You know, sometimes we even believe these things. We can look through all these things and say, you know what, I don't like some of this, but God's right. But then what do we do about it? We don't do much of anything. You know, earlier, we sang you know, one of my favorite songs in the hymnal, I Love to Tell the Story. Uh, we can sing that, uh, but do we love to tell the story, or do we love to talk about telling the story? You know, think about a room of very conservative Christians that can look at the gospel and say this is all true. How often do we actually go out and meet people specifically to tell them the gospel? Just think in your own life. When was the last time that you did that? And if that was average, what would happen to our church? What is happening to the American church? In all of these things, we can see that God has called us to be holy, but we either ignore it or just hope that it goes away. And if you look at all of these things, all of these requirements to be holy, and you are honest with yourself, you know that you can't do it. No, I can't do it. I haven't met anybody on their own that is self-righteous and that can be holy. And that's where hope comes in here. Because this is not just a list of things that God is telling us to do that we're unable to do. This is a requirement to be holy, and a way there, because there's redemption in here. You can see that every time they take a census, there is a hint of redemption. Because every time they take a census of God's people, Every single person over 20, rich or poor, gives half a shekel to God as a ransom for their life. It reminds them that their life is not their own, and that they need to be saved. And every time that you pay on something, it reminds you that it's not yours. Anybody ever think of that when they make a car payment or a house payment? You, know, you like to think of it as your house, but it's really the bank's house until you pay that thing off, right? But eventually, you can pay off the mortgage. This never says that the people actually paid off their lives. It doesn't say in the, you know, 20th installment of this, now you're your own. Every single time it reminds them that their life is still forfeit before God. And all of these things point forward because none of it is final. None of it finishes it. None of these things completely cleanse them or completely make them holy. Paying the ransom never completely pays off their sin debt. All of it points forward to the one person who was holy. The one person who could pay the ransom for our life. It all points forward to Jesus. And in Jesus' perfect life, his perfect obedience to all the rules of God, the way that he died for us, we can be redeemed. And without that holy life that he lived, without the redemption on the cross, we are nothing. And we can think of ourselves as Christians all we like. We can say, I've gone to church for the last eight years. I've helped out all these people. I came back from this awful thing. And none of it matters without Christ, because none of us are perfect. But Christ is perfect, and Christ lived a life for his people, because God wants a holy people to worship him forever. And if 
If God changes our hearts and brings us to follow after Jesus as our Lord and our Savior, then it makes us holy. Not entirely in the way we are right now, but he builds us, he sanctifies us, and every day of our life that goes by, as we read the scriptures, as we're there with God's people, as we serve him, he's bringing us closer and closer to his image. Until one day, he will come back, and he will destroy everything that is evil, and he will bring his people into the new heavens and the new earth. And it is completely and totally holy. The whole thing is God's sanctuary, and his presence is there perfectly. And God has given us a deposit of this. This isn't just purely looking to say, well, life was awful before and it's awful now, and I'm just waiting for when it's good. God has given us a down payment and a seal of this. He's given us the seal of the Holy Spirit. God has made us holy by putting the Holy Spirit inside of his people now. And so when you think about all those things that allowed people to get closer and closer in the presence of God and how they needed the, the smoke screens and the washings and everything else, even the high priest then couldn't be as close to God as God's people now. Because if you are a Christian, then the Holy Spirit lives inside of you. And it brings you to pray. It brings you to seek out holiness. And it brings you to all these things. And it brings you to groan for that day when you will be brought into the new heavens and the new earth. And there will be no more struggle to be holy. Because God will take even our desire to sin away from us. And will be there in his sanctuary. With his holy things as his holy people, where we will follow after him forever. And so as we look forward to that day, whenever it may come, we can remind ourselves that God has called us to be holy because he has redeemed us. Since we have been redeemed, we can pursue holiness. We don't have to say, oh, I said a prayer one time and I checked that off my list and I've got my fire insurance now and I'm going to go on living the way that I was living. We say, wow, God has redeemed me. God has done more for me than he did even back in these days as they went and they paid that tax that their lives were redeemed. God has done even more than when he set up the whole tabernacle and he had the priests and the high priests go into it. God has sent his own son to live a perfect life and die for me. And so now I love him and I want to follow him and I want to be like him. I want to follow his commandments. And so let his redemption drive us to holy living just for the sake of God. It's something that is a higher call than all those things that we said before, even to be effective, or to be well, or to be rich, or to be happy, or any of those things. Let God drive his people to be holy. As we look forward to that day, when he will make us perfectly holy. Let's pray. God, we thank you that though people are disobedient by nature, we want our own things, and sometimes we try to cover it up. That you have showed us who we really are. That all of us without you are hopeless. We thank you that you sent hope. You sent Jesus to come and live the perfectly holy life that we could never live on our own. We thank you that he came to redeem his people. And we ask that if there's anyone here that he is not yet redeemed, that you would send the spirit of that person that you would change their heart of stone and turn it into a heart of flesh that longs after you, that longs to be holy, that longs to follow Jesus as Lord and Savior. And we ask for all of those of us that you have already done that through, that you would continue to sanctify us, that you would make us yearn more and more for holiness, that we would look to the scripture and see what it is that offends you and have a deep desire to put those things down and instead to follow you with our whole lives. We ask that you would put those specific things in our mind now, those things that we know are not honoring to you, and that you would help us to repent from them, and to turn instead to worshiping you. We ask that you would drive us to Scripture daily so we can see what it is that you call us to do. Not what our society says that it is you are, but what Scripture says you are. We ask that all these things, that you would make your people holy, in anticipation for that great day when we will be completely holy and worship you in person. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Continue to worship God as we sing hymn number 356, Redeemed. 356.
love of God the Father, and the grace of Christ the Son, and our fellowship with the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you.